So welcome again to, to the closing lecture of, of the Biobajan conference. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Professor Henri Vandamme, who will um, present about materials, processes, and infrastructures for for the ecological transition. I have to make a confession. I had not heard about Henri before. And, uh, and uh, it was really a delight to explore the, the literature or the lack thereof about Henri on the internet. Actually, Henri is this kind of very big scientist who has a very small electronic footprint. So I had to ask around about Henri and who is this person? And this is uh, very much into uh, an interesting profile that, that I got into. So let me let me uh, tell you a few words about what I, I learned about uh, Professor Henri Vandamme. So he received an education in the fields of agricultural engineering and physics of solids. He earned a PhD from the University of Louvain in Belgium, where he studied the properties of, uh, of glass. He directed the Centre de Recherche sur la matière divisée, Research Centre on Divided Matter, at the University of Orléans in France, where he studied colloidal suspensions and, of course, divided matter. Henri Vandamme became a professor at the ESP, ESC, PCI, School of Industrial Physics and Chemistry in Paris, in 1999. He was a visiting professor at MIT from uh, 2016 to 2018. Henri Vandamme describes himself as a physicist of nanotechnologies. He works, his work deals with the physical and chemical processes that occur in soft matter, divided matter, and interfaces, with applications in material sciences, engineering, and biology. He started his career working on heterogeneous photocatalysis and on the photochemical conversion of solar energy into chemical fuels using colloidal systems. He then developed a growing interest in cement-based materials as paradigm of real-world-oriented complex matter. He initiated the study of clays and cement hydrates using molecular modeling methods, and he extended his research to clay polymer and cement polymer mixture, hybrids and nanocomposites, while pursuing work on the fundamental chemomechanics of cement or clay-based materials. So for the ones of you who do not really understand much about all these uh, mouthful words uh, that are uh, really at the intersection of chemistry, material science, and, 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 and mechanics, let me give you a few examples of the scientific questions uh, that Henri Vandamme explored. Some questions of interest were, where does the cohesion of a granular glue come from in cemented materials? How does concrete flow? So Henri Vandamme is, is also an engaged scientist who made significant contributions to bring awareness to the food, water, energy nexus and to highlight the responsibility of scientists to design sustainable infrastructure, manage waste and energy reliably, and plan territory use ethically. Henri Vandamme was the president of the Condensed Matter Structure and Dynamics chapter of the CNRS, the French National Center of Scientific Research, between 1995 and 2000. And he was also the scientific director at the Laboratoire Central des Ponts et Chaussées, the Central Laboratory of Transportation and Infrastructure in France, in an approximate translation. And he held civil leadership positions in technical committees and boards, notably at École des Ponts Paris Tech, École Nationale des Travaux Publics de l'État, and at the French Institute of Petroleum, and the Commission on Atomic Energy. And in 2009, uh, Henri Vandamme received the Klaus Dickerhoff Prize for his lifetime scientific achievement. So it's really an honor uh, to meet you virtually, Henri, and to give you the floor for this uh, closing lecture. Thank you so much, Chloe, for those kind words, which are always too much. Uh, as I used to say, after those kinds of uh, very favorable words, the best way to keep cool is to directly go home and tell your wife and your children what they said about you. And then the whole family start laughing. So it keeps you <laughs> reasonable. <laughs> okay. Uh, it, it's a real honor for me to, to give this lecture at, at the Bio Bazant conference with two extraordinary people. Uh, to tell the truth, I'm not going to talk about my work because I'm now retired for some time, but I had the opportunity in my life and in different institutions that you see there to meet lots of extraordinary people from which I learned really a lot. And I think that we are living in a time where really interesting things 
are going on. So I'm going to talk about some feelings. To tell the truth, I, you know, after his impressive conference, Professor Bazant gave a few afterthoughts. I'm afraid that my presentation will be essentially a collection of, of afterthoughts <laughs> uh, about the title. Now, uh, after the pandemics will be over, hopefully, we will all go back to our ordinary duties on the global scale, which I think we all agree on our climate change, depletion of natural resources, and development still for many people on the planet. So I'm going to go through this uh, through three entries, land, industry, and infrastructure. So let's start with land. Uh, the last uh, full report of the IPCC, I think, was devoted to climate change and land. And one of the points that they stressed very much is that we are losing a lot of agricultural land. Uh, we are losing land. The land is becoming of, uh, let's say, low quality. So we, we are on, not on a good track. If you look at the living world, uh, we now all agree that biodiversity is, is wealth. And instead of appreciating biodiversity, as far as land use is uh, concerned, what we are doing is this, uh, having huge surfaces, which an important part of the time are really dead zones without any life in it, and which are very sensitive to wind, uh, loss through rain and whatever. So what the IPCC said is that, uh, for instance, one quarter about of ice-free land area is subject to intense degradation. Soil erosion is going right now between something between 10 and 100 times faster than soil formation. And the annual area of dry land is on the average increasing about by 1% per year. Of course, with strong local variability. This is really bad for us. If you look at the, the global map of soil erosion rates, uh, soil erosion can come from various sources. It can be uh, coast erosion, but it can be also due to wind, to, to, to flooding, so whatever. What you see is that, uh, for instance, what you didn't expect perhaps is that Europe is a very bad place uh, right now. Southeast Asia also, and some part of the US and South America also. Now, what, what people most of the time don't know is that soil is a really important player in the, the carbon cycle. Uh, contrary to what most people believe, the, the organic matter, the, the carbon content in the first meter of soil on global scale is about three to four times larger than the amount of uh, carbon above surface. In other words, roots, fungi, uh, dissolved organic matter, mineralized organic matter, uh, wastes of all kinds are three to four times more important than the, the plants, the trees, and all what is above the soil. So it's really an important player. How much is it with, if you look at typical fi uh, figures for temperate countries like France, let's say it's around between 50 and 100 ton per hectare in the first foot uh, below surface, which is quite a lot. Now this is re replenished by residue from living plants but those uh, residues decompose. They are oxidized to CO2 by fungi, uh, uh, bacteria. Uh, some of it is mineralized and is leached out by rain. So there is a, a very large turnover 
But what is important for the quality of soil is the, the, the stock in the soil. And this figure, of course, is not shown to, to be understood. It's just uh, uh, to show you the, the multiplicity of interactions between living matter and the mineral matter, which appears uh, in a soil. Now, among all the, part, all the players which are active in soil, uh, plant roots are uh, very important. Uh, a plant root, if, uh, for make, to make it simple, is something like what you see on the screen here, a kind of long tube with a growing tip uh, as the cell uh, are formed on the tip, they, they, go, they grow and uh, as you go along the tip, they become larger and larger in what people call the elongation zone. So as a roof, as a root penetrates in the soil, well, as you might imagine, it is exerting uh, some mechanical action on the, 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 the soil grains. This is something which has attracted the, att the attention of scientists for quite a long time. This is a picture from Pfeiffer in the 19th century in which he designed a, a simple device to measure the, the force uh, of a root penetrating or encountering an obstacle. And this problem is still going on. In the last decade, several teams in, around the world are doing, of course, much more uh, accurate and, uh, uh, let's say, multifaceted experiments to study the mechanical interaction between roots penetrating in soil and, and the, grains, the grains of the soil compartment. This can be done, for instance, using artificial soils composed of photoelastic uh, media. It can be done with very advanced techniques like uh, the chairperson of this uh, <laughs> conference has been involved in. This is taken from the, the thesis of Floriane Anselmucci who attended this conference. What you see there are uh, tomographic pictures of a seed growing uh, in a soil over a period of about seven days. Uh, seven days. Uh, as you can see here is that the response of the root or the seed to the density of the, the soil uh, is very different and very dependent on the density of the soil. And quite intuitively, uh, you see that in a dense soil, which is unfortunately what is happening almost everywhere around the world, uh, seeds and roots have a much more difficult time to grow and to penetrate. Now, first thought, you might think that this is something which is of mechanical nature. Uh, I forgot to say that, and what uh, Floriana and, his, and her team also did was to not only look at what happened with the root, but look at what happened around the root, uh, look at the, the volumetric strain, volume, volumetric strain, the deviatoric strain around the roots, and as you may expect, very significant differences are observed between dense soils and loose soils. Uh, something totally unexpected, at least from my point of view, happened in the beginning of this year with a paper in which people showed that contrary to, let's say, first thought, the reaction of uh, a growing root uh, to the compactness of a soil, loose or dense, is not uh, at first a mechanical action. It could be a mechanical action, but in addition to that, there is something else, else which is of totally chemical and biological nature, in the sense that what the people of this paper in science showed is that it's a matter of hormone transmission. What they show is that roots emit an hormone which is ethylene, may seem surprising, but uh, after all, we are using nitrogen oxide as a neurotransmitter and roots are using ethylene as a hormone. So what roots do is they emit ethylene in a loose soil, of course, Ethylene diffusion is easy, and the stationary uh, concentration of ethylene in the soil in contact with the root is low. But in a dense soil, 
permeation is, is much more difficult and the stationary concentration of ethylene is higher. And this triggers the response of the root. They show that by replacing dense and loose soil just by a thin layer of vacuum grease around the root, which prevents the ethylene from diffusing. So what you see is that a simple, well, apparently simple phenomena like root penetration in a soil is something which uh, involves quite a lot of coupling between mechanical and chemical and biochemical action. Another important point, uh, which is very exciting for, let's say, mechanical pe people in mechanics or uh, physics, is how do uh, worms, for instance, penetrate in sediments, in sediments and, and soils? This is something which is extensively uh, studied in the team of Kelly Morgan. And what she, she showed is that you can design a kind of phase diagram with the density of the soil on wax, one axis and uh, the type of uh, the, 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 the humidity on the other axis, where you see that depending on the density and uh, the, the mechanical character of the soil, uh, a worm can swim, it can fracture the, the medium, or it can just displace the grain. Again, this is a, a clear example that where, uh, as far as mechanics uh, and the pro mechanics of this medium is concerned, there are really interesting problems which are raised. And this gave rise, uh, we were discussing this right before the, the beginning of the talk, this gave rise in the US, but also in France and in, I'm sure in many other countries, to networks and people uh, try to learn from what is happening in the bio world, in soil, to eventually improve uh, the, the way we, 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 we work in soil. In other words, uh, this is a new field, which you might call bio-inspired uh, geomechanics. Uh, my feeling after looking at several examples is that, and looking at what IPCC said, is that in addition to this uh, bio-inspired way of looking at things, uh, we should perhaps also look at the system for itself in the sense that uh, right now we are doing geomechanics for building, essentially, building infrastructure, uh, arranging the land or building buildings. Uh, well, I think it's probably it's time to do geomechanics of soil uh, in order to understand and master the ecosystem for itself. Of course, it's probably hopeless to try to model or to, 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 to hope, be able to model the whole system with all the life. It's just like uh, what uh, Christian said in the debate uh, this morning about uh, uh, bone. Bone is nice because you're, you don't have too much cells in it. Well, probably we could do geomechanics of an ecosystem just by considering the, the many different types of organic matter, not living, which are in the, in the soil and which, which is really important for the, the quality of the soil as far as food production is concerned. After all, this is not too far from what people in rock geomechanics did when they switched from, uh, let's say, organic free rocks to source rocks in which you have 10 to 15% in some cases, organic matter, which can be in a brittle state under the glass transition temperature or in a viscoplastic state above the glass transition temperature. After all, the 31st centimeter of uh, agriculture soil are not that far from a, an organic rich source rock. Second point which I would like to address is, is industry. Uh, and the industry is moving, as, as, as you all know. Uh, some people say that we are right now in the fourth industrial revolution. The first one is the, the real big one in the 19th century or even before. The second one is uh, when industry went to mass production. 
The third one is not that far. It's when robotic production was introduced. And the fourth one is what people consider is what happening is what is close to happening in Amazon storage center right now with a fully connected and robotic system, Internet of Things. Now, as far as, uh, on, let's say, on, on a more technical uh, point of view, I would like to address two points. One evolution is definitely process intensification. And this is mostly happening in uh, chemical engineering, process engineering. And something else which is happening almost everywhere is that uh, people use increasingly electricity to do everything. So uh, the concept of uh, intensification in, in chemical engineering is that, well, people try to go away from the classical parad paradigm. The paradigm is in chemical engineering is that when you try to design a complex process, you split it down in what people call unit operations, mixing, heating, reacting, separating, so ever. And for each operation, you design a device. And this gives you, uh, this leads generally to very large plants. And what people try to do right now, and very capital intensive plants, people try to go the opposite way to miniaturize things and to perform several operations in the same device. Uh, if you wish, it's like going back to, let's say, introducing microfluidics in real life, not only for analytical purposes, but for production purposes. A few examples, well, for instance, replacement of uh, energy consuming mixers with static mixers in which thanks to the control rheology and let's say chaotic control, you, you, you mix things. Reactors in which uh, you design, uh, those are not really porous materials. It's a, it's a kind of porous device with multi-channels channeling the reactants and the products where you want them to, to go. A good example is what is going to uh, being extensively developed probably is of the industry of uh, carbon capture and, and storage. Let's say people in geomechanics have been extensive and they are extensively interested in underground storage of CO2, but the capture of CO2 is also a very interesting problem. The, the most extensively used, at least at pilot scale right now, is uh, what people call CO2 scrubbing. It's a dissolution of the CO2 from flue gas or from the atmosphere into a solution, an aqueous solution of an amine, which binds the CO2. Uh, uh, the process is a, is a two-step process. In the first step, the CO2 is contacted with the amine solution. Uh, it's dissolved. In the second step, you heat the solution and the CO2 is, uh, is removed uh, in, a, in a pure form. Now, the key point there is to have in a, as compact as possible volume, the as good as possible contact between the gas phase and the flowing aqueous amine solution. And this led people to explore, uh, not, as I said, not porous materials, but very porous devices, which are made by 3D printing in order to optimize as far as possible the contact between the, the, the gas and, and, the, and the liquid. This is just an example of a pilot plant uh, in Oak Ridge. And this is applied from, to flu gases, not only from uh, plants, but also to, air cap to CO2 capture from, from air. Some people think that we are not going to match the two degrees C goal if we just uh, do what we can do about uh, going to green energy source and, and etc. But we will have to do some, in addition to that, we will have to do some CO2 scavenging 
from the atmosphere directly, which is, of course, a very difficult process, but on which there is already uh, there are already some uh, good demonstration installation. This one is in Switzerland. This one is in Iceland. And of course, in order to be acceptable, this has to run with renewable energy. In the case of Iceland, it's running to with geothermal energy. Another device where the concept of process intensification is applying is heat exchanger. In the case of carbon capture and storage and cap carbon capture, you need a heat an heat exchanger to uh, uh, remove the, the CO2 from the amine solution. There are in chemical engineering, there are lots uh, egg heat exchanger are probably the most extensively used piece of equipment in, in chemical engineering. And again, again, this is not the pearls medium, but it looks like, and this is made by uh, 3D printing to improve the contact between uh, two fluids at different temperature. Now, I was really surprised to learn that one of the most, when you reach this type of fine detail uh, with fluids at very different temperature, the mechanical stresses which are raised due to the difference in temperature become one of the main, if not the main problem for the durability of the device. Uh, one of the most exciting solution uh, to which people arrived is this type of structure, which is a kind of bio-inspired structure. It's a, what people call a bicontinuous uh, structure. It's the kind of structure that you find in some surfactant solution and the intracellular uh, solution of the living world. It's a kind of uh, very wavy material in which you have channels such that if you enter the medium, this is one, this one is called a geroid. If you enter the medium in one pore, you can cross the whole system without ever meeting uh, the other uh, set of channels. In other words, this is a type of device in which two fluids can cross the system without ever meeting uh, each other. This is ideal for heat exchange and in other cases that I will illustrate later also. Something which is not very different from this is the case of membranes. Uh, I took this paper because I think it's really very promising, uh, although it's dealing with uh, fossil fuels, <laughs> but fossil fuels are still going with us for some time, I think. This is a, a paper which appeared last year in which people showed that for the first time, they were able to do the equivalent of crude oil distillation in a membrane. I thought that this was not too difficult with the kind of membrane that where people are able to do right now, but I was wrong. Uh, it's a real tough problem because you need pores in a range going from, let's say, three angstroms to several nanometers for the different molecules that you have. And the point with polymers membrane is that uh, in, in the myriad of molecules that you find in crude oil, there is always a good solvent for the type of polymer that you used for the membrane. Of course, you might say you can do the same thing with me uh, ceramic membranes, but that's even more difficult as far as material science is concerned. What people in this paper succeeded to do is to do a membrane with pores uh, of a narrow size distribution around a few angstrom in a polymer which was, which was rigid enough to not swell and not, and not dissolve in the presence of uh, the, the molecules of crude oil. And they were able to do the equivalent of distillation, of course, by applying quite a lot of uh, pressure to the to the device. And of course, they didn't look at the mechanics of the thing, but this is probably a very interesting pro mechanics uh, uh, problem uh, with a multiplicity of fluids going in parallel into different populations of, of pore sizes. Uh, we had a, a lot of interest in multi scale problems during this conference. And let me just illustrate 
the kind of uh, evolution going on in process engineering, which brings process engineering not far from uh, our interest in, 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 in program mechanics. This is a paper from a team uh, from Andre Tsudar in ETH Zurich, in which he, he, he designed a multi-scale membrane, uh, multi-scale, let's say, two-scale membrane in a very controlled way. What the team did was to start with a, a polymer, which was a blend of two different polymer in a miscible state, monomers, two monomer mixtures in, in, in a miscible state. Then photopolymerize the two components. When they polymerize, they become non-miscible, so they demix. Then you can remove one of them, just like people do when they prepare Viper glass, one of the model materials, which is a favorite of uh, people doing porous material science. And with this phase separated material, which a pore, with a pore size in the nanometer range, they 3D printed a kind of geroid structure, which I showed before, which introduced a sudden scale uh, in which different fluids, two different fluids could be uh, flowed without meeting each other for, for, for heat exchange, for instance. I think that this is opening quite a lot of, of course, this is only an example where two scales are involved, but I'm sure that pretty soon people will be able to do real multi-scale devices like this, uh, and with, let's say, unexpected applications, at least in my mind. Second case of evolution in industry is electrification. And the point is here is that uh, electrodes and membranes, protonic membranes, ox oxygen transferring membranes, are going to be really key media in, in the future as we go to solar energy, wind energy, all this as electricity is going to be used in batteries, in, in, in electrical, electrochemical cell, not only to, to be used for producing motion, like in cars, but also to produce chemicals. Of course, we all know about water electrolysis, where you produce hydrogen and oxygen from water, but electrolysis could be applied to CO2 to make organic compounds. It could be applied to nitrogen to make ammonia and fertilizers. So there is a, a totally new type of electrochemistry which is being developed in which the, 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 the behavior of porous materials, the membranes and the, the electrodes is really to be key. And once again, uh, many times people developing this type of device are facing a problem where they want the, the electrode or the membrane to be a good transmitter for two different fluids or for one gas and for one fluid, which is something which is intrinsically difficult. Unless you control the wettability of each component in the porous medium. And this is what uh, a team from Imperial College succeeded to do. And not surprisingly, they came from the reservoir rock engineering. Uh, this team has access to the uh, real, very powerful uh, imaging uh, devices uh, where they have sub micrometric access to, to, to the structure. What you see on the screen here is, is, a, is a, a reservoir rock uh, full of oil and brine water, salt water. So uh, I think the, well, uh, the, the red is the rock, uh, the yellow is the brine and the blue is the oil. No, the blue is the brine and the yellow is the oil. Uh, what is really uh, amazing in what people succeed to do 
is that the, the resolution of their structural tool is such that at sub micrometer level, they can measure the curvature of the meniscus between the oil and the brine phase. And what they discovered is that transport of the two fluids is the easiest when the average curvature of the meniscus is zero, which means that it has a, a perfect saddle shape. And at that point, the pore pressure vanishes completely and you have a system in which you, have, you are able to move oil and move water or hair as if there was no capillary pressure in the system. And this is where I think extremely promising uh, in the sense that uh, it opens the way for a, a kind of pore mechanics in which uh, there is an additional parameter that we could control and which could really lead to totally different result, which is the di distribution of wettability into the porous medium. Of course, in, in the case of this uh, rock reservoir, they didn't control it. They just found, uh, maybe by chance, uh, a sample in which the mixture of wettability was such that there was, a, on the average, let's say 50% of oil wet uh, walls and 50% of uh, water wet walls. But uh, this could be new, done on, on purpose. Well, last point of my, my presentation, uh, concrete and infrastructure. Uh, again, back, going back again to the IPCC report, I was surprised to see that the, the area covered by infrastructure, according to IPCC, on a global scale is only 1% of the global ice-free land surface area which is not that much, which is okay. Of course, what this doesn't tell you is that this is very depending on where you are. In France, for instance, uh, many people say that we are close to 15%. And people say that we are losing one department, the equivalent of a state in the US, for instance, every 10 years covered with asphalt or concrete. Which is, which is really terrible. Uh, but in other places of the world, for instance, if you go to <laughs> southern Algeria or Namibia, it's close to zero. So 1% is fine, but the heterogeneity is uh, really large. Now, what, this, what does this cover? Well, in, in a country like the United States, for instance, well, you all, you all know this uh, since the president decided to <laughs> do a, a, a huge effort in this field. Uh, for instance, for the US, you have more than 6 million kilometers of public roadways, uh, thousands of public use airports, uh, close to 100, 100 nuclear reactors, millions of kilometers of sewer remains, fresh waters, pipes, and whatever. So it's really huge. And most of this is made of, as you know, with with concrete. Uh, as Professor Bazant mentioned in his last slide, we, we really make a lot of concrete. We make about 30 billion tons of concrete with the 4 billion tons of cement that we produce. This represents 10 cubic kilometer. And I say most people agree that there is nothing that will be able to replace concrete in, in the near future. Now, some people think that concrete could be used for amazing things. <laughs> I think that I would be, you would be amazed to see that some people make uh, do fashion with, uh, with concrete, probably a little heavy to wear, but uh, it's okay. Uh, the problem is that for the general public, concrete is a really poor image. It's perceived as dull and repetitive. Uh, construction is industry is is considered to be a low-tech industry, uh, blame, it's blamed for climate change and CO2 emissions, depletion of natural resources, and for instance, and uh, the point which I already made about 
lots of farmland and woods and responsible because of uh, this imperviousness of soil for flash floods, uh, especially in, in some hilly areas. Roads are an important part of this uh, total infrastructure uh, heritage. Here is a map of the distribution of major roads in the world. And what you, where you, you see, of course, uh, this is what you would expect probably. Uh, Eastern United States, the coastal regions, Northern Africa, Europe, India, Eastern A East Asia, and so on. Now, some people like Lawrence uh, try to see. Uh, well, well, one thing I, I, I forgot to say is that uh, some people from IPCC and elsewhere estimate that we are going to build 50 million kilometers in the next uh, three decades. And most of it, as you, you would think, is going to occur in developing regions. 25 million kilometers is four times the total road length of the US. It's quite a lot. Now, where is this going to build and what will the decision be based on? Well, what the author did is to look at the environmental cost of building roads. And the green regions are where the cost would be high. They also looked at where the benefits could be high for helping producing more food, having more intense uh, business going on. And of course, uh, when you match the two maps, uh, you reach the regions where there will be conflict between its both uh, interesting from an economic point of view, and you have a very high environmental value. And the, the region where the conflict is highest, they are the black region on this map. Unfortunately, as you see, well, they are quite large, but they, they are very localized. Uh, the point is that roads right now are considered, especially by car makers, just as a, as a kind of dummy space where the, the clever thing, which is the car, is, is moving. But that's probably not going on to go on forever, uh, as roads are important part of, the la part of the land area. People are thinking more and more about using the, the road network to do other things. Of course, it's connecting people and, and business by moving people and goods. But it also, it's also a way to distribute energy. Uh, it could be a place where we could harvest energy, solar or wind and CO2. It could be used to treat wastewater, to recycle plastics, rubber. And it could be a place with all the cameras that we install a place to observe diversity, biodiversity, and the, the health state of, of forest. So roads could be, uh, let's say, a much cleverer and much more active place than what it is right now. Uh, again, uh, what people have in mostly in mind most of the time is the, the automated road, let's say, with clever cars, automated self-driving cars, running on it and what they ask for the road is just to, uh, to be as clean with beautiful signs on it and that, that's it. But roads could be an active player in the development of uh, self-driving car for sure. Uh, I skipped other points like self-healing uh, uh, pavements, uh, active defrosting devices run by solar or wind energy or whatever. In general, roads, is prob roads are probably going to be much more in a much more active space than what it is right now. Now, back to the material, the basic material of not only of roads, but all the infrastructure concrete. Uh, with all the bad things which I said before, what could we do? Well, here is just a list of possible things uh, going from nano to, to macro. At the nanoscale, one of the first things to do is to 
nano-engineer the glue, the CSH or the aluminum version of it, or the mixed version of it. And for sure, we have still a lot of understand, and there is still a lot of room to improve the nanostructure and the mesostructure uh, of CSH uh, in the glue. Uh, but uh, let me just point just two, let's say, observations, uh, which I always found very, uh, let's say, unknown and un un ununderstood. One is the composition of the real glue of concrete, which is CSH or its aluminum rich version. Here is a, is a plot of the calcium of silicon ratio as a function of the aging time of a cement paste from a few days to more than 40 years. And what you see is that, as we all know, is that the calcium to silicon ratio is rather content, constant and with an average of about 1.7. Now, what is more, uh, let's say, um, strange is that if you look at the distribution, the local distribution of calcium to silicon ratio in a cement paste uh, using data for, from Re Jan Richardson, for instance, who did extensive characterization in this field, what you see is that young paces have a very broad distribution of calcium to silicon ratio. Always the same average one, but the distribution is very broad. And as time goes on, the calcium to silicon ratio gets a narrower and a narrower distribution. And this follows a logarithmic scale. Again, you might seem, okay, logarithmic scale is something which is fitting everything which is progressively slowing down as a function of time. But I think this is very, well, it, it's question, it's questioning. Why is this logarithmic? Why is, uh, it brings me back to the, the, the question of why is creep logarithmic, which has been extensively addressed in this conference and which is still a problem not totally clear, I think, clear, I think. And the same happens for as far as, as you see here, uh, the chemistry is concerned in the absence of, uh, of stress. Another point which I think uh, is uh, very questioning and which is not far from what has been discussed during the conference and which is not very well known is that there is a very strong isotopic effect in the hydration of cement. Uh, as Thomas and Jennings have shown uh, more than 20 years ago, Hydration of cement in D2O in heavy water is much, much slower than in light water. What is also very strange is that the, the surface area accessible to water or to heavy water is very different as you measured by NMR, which is now a classical method. Uh, a paste hydrated with light water as a, by NMR, a measured surface area of 200 square meters per gram. If you perform hydration with D2O, it's only half of it. Well, I think understanding this is still open problem, but it, it points to uh, something which is pretty clear, I think, is that uh, there is a special link between water and the hydrates in, in the case of, uh, of cement pastes. Second thing that we could do is to use less clinker in cement and do substitutions with supplementary material. This is something which is going on on a, on a very wide scale right now, as you know. Third point thing that we could do is to do better concrete with less cement. Better concrete means a lot of things. It can be stronger, but it can be, as Professor Bajan emphasized, more durable, uh, creeping more slowly, less. Uh, again, this boils uh, most of the time back to the, the formulation of the concrete, uh, the, the aggregate mixture that, that we use. Uh, a very interesting correlation which was published a few years ago by uh, the Brazilian team is this type of plot in which they ask the question, 
how much kilogram of cement of binder do I need to get one megapascal of compressive strength? And what you see is that the, the evolution of uh, the plot with something like uh, 500 data, as far as I remember, data points, shows that uh, uh, it gets narrower uh, as you go to high performance concrete. In other words, it tells you that there are many different ways to do bad concrete and not many ways to do uh, excellent concrete. Uh, now, this is something where uh, what Mathieu Boshi talked about during the conference, uh, machine learning could be something really useful. Here's a plot from another team in which people plot the compressive strength as a function of the cement content of concrete. And what you see is that uh, in the database of, I forgot how many materials, what you see is that the scatter is enormous. If you look at the concrete with a strength of 50 MPa, for instance, which is pretty good concrete, what you see is that some people are able to reach this performance with 100 kilograms of cement per cubic meter, or even less, while some other are using close to 500 uh, cement, kilograms of cement per cubic meter, which means that by optimizing the, the formulation, we could use much less cement than uh, what we are using right now. Of course, durability is also another aspect which has to be taken into account. Now, on this point, machine learning is working pretty well, predicting the uh, compressive strength from a, from a lear learning set applying whatever it is, uh, uh, different types of uh, machine learning methods. The point here is that this has not been done so far, but this could be turned into a design tool. Uh, one of the biggest surprises of my life was two years ago when I got a phone call from people from Google uh, wanting to discuss about uh, concrete. And I asked the people, why is Google interested? What, what is what's going on? They said, we have a department going, studying cementitious material, which means that some people perhaps think that there is more business to do, or <laughs> there is at least good business to do with uh, designing numerical digital tools, digital design tools, uh, in parallel with uh, mat real material science. Going back to the different types of things that we could do, of course, use locally available materials. We heard about reactive tailings, but not tailings are bad. <laughs> I mean, there, there are some inert tailings and raw earth uh, without too much organic matter and without chemical is something which can be used to for construction not really for infrastructure, but at least for building. And the techniques which are used for con construction with concrete are increasingly used with uh, compressed earth, uh, including prefabrication. This is an example in Switzerland. Optimize the use of concrete. Well, in the metal industry, uh, topology optimization is something which is extensively used. Uh, some famous engineers and architects like Pierluigi Nervi used it uh, several decades ago. And uh, probably this is something which is not developed enough uh, in the present state of affairs. We could probably improve quite a lot uh, the use of concrete, diminish the use of concrete in our structure uh, by using this type of uh, topology optimization. This gives you eyes to nice pictures, which are not really reasonable, but uh, at least it may excite people to, to try to think about it. Uh, what else could we do to improve the, 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 print, the imprint of, of concrete? Well, get rid of formworks. And this is, of course, uh, among other things, what people try to do by using 3D printing here is, I think, is an impressive example of uh, a wind tower, the base of a wind tower, 
which has been built in collaboration with, between General Electric and Lafarge Old Sim. They intend to build towers 80 meters tall. Uh, they are not yet there right now, but they, they are already at, I think, at 30 meters right now. Uh, and of course, as uh, some people discussed in the, in the meeting, this is made basically a, a tough rheological problem in the fresh state. Many other things could be done, removing uh, as much reinforcement impossible, provided we have a, a good enough metrics, uh, use eventually self-organizing types of uh, reinforcement, like uh, stitches, <laughs> like what you see here. Again, this is really open field for, for research. Or the ultimate is probably whatever we do to try to make a material and infrastructure that we could recycle. Because in addition to durability, the ability to be recycled is probably as important. Well, with that, I, I finished my presentation. Uh, I think the message here is that be it in agriculture, food production, be it in chemical engineering and the new energies, in, in particular the electric energies, be it, be it in classical infrastructure building, the, the mechanics of, I would call them porous bodies. And the difference between a, a device, this is the word used in chemical engineering and, and materials, this is the word that we use. I think the, the, the difference between a device and a material is probably getting going to get smaller and smaller. And the same type of approach is going to, to be used in both cases. But whatever we do, in all cases, and I borrowed this slide from my friend Franz, mechanics is going to be essential. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Henri, for, for this uh, very inspiring talk. Um, we have time for questions, so I'll, uh, I'll open the floor for commentaries or questions from the audience. But this was not very technical, you know. <laughs> I see a lot of applause. <laughs> Jim has uh, a question. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. I was reluctant to ask right away, but uh, thank you for a really inspiring talk on so many levels. I really enjoyed your opening remark about the humbling effects of uh, wife and uh, one's one's wife and, and children or partner and children. <laughs> and I was really inspired by uh, the talk that um, is sharing work that's not your own. That's just a, an inspiring way to get to give a, a very thought provoking lecture. So thank you so much for that. And on that note, I'm, I'm a uh, soils person, a geomechanics person who was really interested in what you were saying about uh, sequestering carbon in soils, which uh, you know, I haven't given enough thought to. And in fact, partly because it seems like such a kind of provocative thing to think about in a way that you know that the material isn't gonna stay there. It's not necessarily uh, sequestered. It's a very dynamic process mm -hmm. in much the same way that I was thinking as you were talking that municipal solid waste actually in burying your garbage is a, is a very effective way, presumably, of, of sequestering carbon. So I, I guess to turn it into a question, what I was hoping for is if you could revisit quickly this, uh, this business of soils as a possible mechanism for sequestering carbon and how effective that's going to be relative to other things that tend to dominate the discussion. Thank you. Okay. Well, you are totally right. First, thank you for your comment. Uh, and you are totally right in the sense that uh, the carbon content of soil is, it's a dynamic process. So we're talking about a stationary concentration. Uh, the organic matter is uh, continuously degrading both to the atmosphere and to the, the subsoil, to the atmosphere is CO2. And once the organic matter has been mineralized, well, it's, it's flushed down uh, by water. So the your, the organic content 
is fluctuation depending on the rate of entry and uh, inlet and outlet. Uh, how useful it could be to use this uh, reservoir of carbon to solve or to try to solve our climate problem is surprisingly uh, easy, at least on the paper, in the sense that I don't have the figures anymore in mind, but I think it's 1,500 billion tons of carbon in the first third, the first foot of soil. If you look at the annual emissions of CO2 that we are do, go, doing right now, it's about, I think, 38 billion tons of CO2, which amounts to 8 billion tons of carbon. Well, 8 billion tons of carbon per year represents 4 per thousand, 0.4 percent of the carbon uh, in, in the first 10 to 30 centimeters. And this gave rise to a, a, a project which people call in French les, les quatre pour mille, which means four per, per thousand, which means that people say, if we can uh, increase by 0.4% every year, the amount of carbon in soil coming from whatever we, we do, we solve the CO2 problem. So it's not that much. We, the, the, the amount of carbon in soil is so large that even uh, minor fluctuations represent for the atmosphere uh, huge amounts. So uh, I think, if I understood correctly, your idea to use this carbon reservoir as a way to control what is going above the surface is totally relevant. Thank you so uh, much. Thank uh, you. It, 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 it can even go further than that. Uh, you might be aware that, uh, uh, of course, all the oil companies are trying to, uh, let's say, <laughs> Uh, reinish your th their business and one of the the good way to do it at least uh, for those and most of them do who produce natural gas is to decompose natural pyrolyze natural gas CH, ch4 methane into hydrogen and this gives you a residue of carbon and this carbon could be stored in the soil because it 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 mix it's mixed pretty easily with the organ the existing organic matter of soil it gets a little bit oxidized so after a while this carbon which in the beginning is pure carbon uh, as time goes on resembles uh, very much the carbon which comes the organic matter which comes from living plants so what some people have been considering that we could produce clean hydrogen, not totally green hydrogen, but blue hydrogen from natural gas and storing the carbon in the soil instead of burning the natural gas and emitting the CO2 in the atmosphere. And again, the, the, the numbers are right. Those are huge amounts uh, and it, it fits what we could do. Thank you so much, uh, Henri, for, for this uh, for this insightful uh, response. Are there other comments or, or questions? Yes, Gilles. Yeah, ju just a, a comment, a, 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 a question that I've been uh, asking. I'm always asking when I look at all these uh, things that, uh, of course, we try to diminish emission of uh, carbon dioxide and so forth. It is always at the price of more energy. Right. And then the issue is, do we look, uh, are we in a virtuous circle uh, so that the uh, amount of energy that we'll be consuming will generate less waste, whatever the waste is, 
mm. than uh, what we will uh, produce, than, than what we will absorb or not. I'm always a little bit surprised to see that, uh, in fact, we sort of think like as if energy was infinite. And what, what, what will well, you answer to such a comment? Uh, uh, two points on, on your good question, excellent question. Uh, first point, I think we, we have to face reality. And uh, uh, reality is that, uh, let's say, two thirds of the world is still in the developing stage. And that those people are going to use a lot of energy. Now, we can do all what we can so that this type of energy is uh, green energy. But uh, let's be realistic. I mean, uh, at least for one or two decades, it's going to be a, a mixture where uh, fossil energies will still be quite important, at least for one or two decades. The second point is that, is energy infinite? The answer is yes. Uh, solar energy is really infinite. And right now, it's not 99%. It's 99.999999% it's dissipated already in the atmosphere. So um, the, the problem is not, in my opinion at least, the total amount of energy, it's just, it's an entropy problem. It's the, the amount which is dissipated. Uh, do, do we dissipate, uh, let's say in a worse way than what, nature is doing or are we doing it, it in a better way for me that's the question it's not a it's not a question of total amount of energy we we receive from the sun a lot of energy and most of it is converted to heat anyway so the point is to do it clever in a clever way but perhaps i'm too optimistic <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Other comments or questions? I I have one for for Ori. Ori, in your you had uh, land. Um, what was the second one? Industry and uh, infrastructure. Uh -huh. um, we haven't touched on water. We're in a conference of you know porous materials. There's the solid part. There's the water part of it. Okay. So. Um, Will any of your conclusion change given the problems we're looking at with water? You are totally right, and I'm sorry. <laughs> I should have I should have made a fourth point because uh, this is of course a point where, uh, considering that surface water is going to diminish and that uh, underground water is going to be more and more important because. Uh, and this is typically, of course, again, a problem of coupling of mechanics and, and fluid mechanics in underground reservoirs. Uh, if you look at what's happening in North, in North Africa right now, uh, it's really terrible. Of course, they, they or in some parts of the of the US, where the let's say the underground water is extensively pumped at such a rate that it's no longer replenished. Uh, you're right. I think desalination is, of course, not the long-term solution, probably. Unless, unless, again, it's a, a matter of circular economy. Uh, unless we find a way to to use the brine or the salt to do something clever. But that's not the case right now. We, we just treat the brine and the salt as, as a waste. And we deeply modify the composition of uh, seawater in the close vicinity of the desalination plants. So we'll, 
No, I, <laughs> I don't have a, a good answer to, to your point, but it's a good point, of course. So, Thank you very much. Thank you. Henri, I had a, a question uh, on no, more from a, a, an educator perspective. You, you, you talked a lot about um, what we could do to make the world better. Um, and, you know, I, even though I'm an engineer by training, in practice, what I do every day is advising students and teaching. So what can I do? Um, what's your view on redesigning the, the curricula uh, so that we have we train and, 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 and make uh, the younger generation more aware of the problems that you're raising. You, you made an opening statement on the fact that we are going more and more towards bio-inspired geomechanics, but perhaps we should also use mechanics for the sake of modeling the ecosystem. I believe that uh, earth science does that a little bit, but um, most of the earth scientists don't have a very strong uh, mechanics background very often. And on the other hand, in civil engineering, most of our systems are reduced to the scale of a foundation or a building. And in fact, at the undergrad level, uh, my junior class is very much all about designing a beam. And we don't really go much beyond that. We, we stress the beam in all directions you want. And we elongate it, we buckle it, everything. But uh, so what can we do uh, to, 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 to redesign the curriculum a little bit? Thank you, Chloe, for this question. This is a point which <laughs> I think France is also very sensitive too. <laughs> I think first point is that uh, we should tell young people, uh, tell them as often as possible that civil engineering is the key science for solving the problem that we are facing. I think, as you said, uh, what young people have in mind is that Civil engineering is okay, it's beam calculations. Resistance des matériaux en français, okay? <laughs> and uh, it's of course much more about, about that. Even, e even problems like one we are living in right now, pandemics, is to some extent a problem of space organization. Uh, so, Civil engineering in a broad sense of the word, and this should be the message for young people, is something which is really touching almost all aspects of our lives. Moving, living, uh, food, health, it's touching everything. And there are not many fields of science and engineering which are as broad as that. Uh, so uh, in practice, how to change the curriculum? Well, we should not go too far either. <laughs> Removing the basics is, is really bad. <laughs> but, uh, and of course the, the amount of teaching hours is limited also. We cannot uh, over flood young people with hours and hours of teaching. But perhaps, uh, I don't know, um, by raising problems uh, in, in such terms that they, they see the, the ultimate goal of it instead of the immediate goal. This may be perhaps uh, the simplest way that we can do uh, in everyday teacher's life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I can very much appreciate that. The, um, our students are very much about the so what question and, and they are more curious than what you may think. And some, sometimes my students are like, but you're a researcher, why don't you never talk about your research when, when you teach us mechanics of beams, right? So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I see that Pune has a question. Yes, thank you very much, Chloe. Merci beaucoup, Henri, pour cette excellente présentation. Uh, I have a follow-up comment on Chloe's questions about, uh, you know, how we can teach students. I think uh, we all deal with sustainability, resiliency, and these kind of things. I think these are the emerging terms that currently we use in, in teaching, and it's very related to that um, ecosystem-oriented geomechanics, I believe. 
then how we can include sustainability and resiliency in engineering mechanics, especially in second year course or third year, you know, engineering courses. It's, I believe this is very important and we have to uh, have more discussion uh, in this regard. Uh, yeah, long-term analysis, sustainability, resiliency, uh, in the context of climate change, I think these are very important topics. Thank you. I, thank you. Uh, when you were, during the time you were talking, I was thinking about exactly about one experience I had two years ago. This was in Nairobi. There was a conference devoted only to people under 25 about civil engineering. And I never saw an audience as enthusiastic about civil engineering as those people, only African people. This was fantastic. So uh, <laughs> we should perhaps go teach uh, in other places, perhaps. <laughs> I don't know. But it was really uh, fantastic to see. That's a very inspiring suggestion. Yes, uh, what I'm hearing a lot uh, at the end of the day is not so much uh, what we teach that needs to change, but perhaps the mentality, the okay. uh, problems and, and, and then the context of, of, of that. Um, is there a final question or comment for, for Henri? Do you see Andy, a prospect for re-engineering significantly chemistry of cement so that we so the production would emit much less CO2? Mm -hmm. Well, as you know as well as, as me, is that uh, the only let's say reasonable way to do it right now is to to use extensively supplementary materials. Uh, the point but is that- It has been done for the last 30 years and maybe it cannot go so much farther. No, no it's, it's, it, this is something which cannot go on forever. Uh, the kind of thing that uh, Karen Screamer is developing is interesting using calcined clays, uh, but that, that's not really new. Uh, using clays, calcined clays as supplementary material has been going on for quite a long time now, but doing it systematically with good standards may, may be a progress. Uh, uh, the other point about alkali activated materials, I think even the, the champions of this option uh, agree that this is not going to solve all type of application. It's, it, it's an excellent solution for some applications, but it's not a general solution to the problem. So th that's why uh, uh, recycling what we have now may be perhaps the, in the long term, the good option. If we find, way to find ways to do it uh, at a reasonable energy cost and financial cost. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I believe I'll, 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 uh, I'll wait for another 10 seconds to see if uh, anybody else has a final thought. All right, otherwise, I, I think this is, this is the closure of the closure. <laughs> so thank let me uh, let me thank again, uh, Henri and uh, um, feel free to unmute yourself and, and give a, a big round of, of applause for Henri and all the people who asked questions and participated uh, lovely in, in this conference. Uh, really, thank you. Perhaps uh, I will let my two other co-chairs say a few words to conclude the conference as well. I see that uh, 
France film is online and then and as well the uh, Gianluca Cusat is uh, uh, on my end uh, I'd like to say that it was a, a real adventure to organize this conference in the midst of the pandemic and after several postponement of different events and it was a real research process to think about creatively about different ways to engage the community and uh, to think about different ways to, to, to disseminate uh, our finding and bring the community together um, I'll, I'll let uh, France and, and Gianluca add to this and uh, really thank you everyone for for your participation okay so thank you very much uh, uh, all of you who participated uh, we learned so much through this uh, uh, conference uh, which we had no idea how it would turn out we had just a bad experience of the first zoom conferences like all of you and we never wanted to do it again but i think we found a format where through the plenary uh, uh, debates through the engagement of all the speakers, which uh, uh, gave us, uh, first of all, the sense of a community, which was the first focus where we wanted to organize this conference together. Um, it also gave us other ideas, like uh, pre-recording a talk actually makes a conference sometimes much better. Or eventually, we can even think about that this becomes a future of ways of, pub of uh, publishing in addition to a written paper comments so i believe there's much coming out here we also had the feeling that many who typically would not ask a question in this zoom setting ask questions so for all this year i would like to thank you all i wish you all very well and i can't wait to see you again in 3d 4d and beyond zoom uh, i wish you very well and i pass it on for Gianluca to close it thank you very much Yes, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Well, first of all, I want to thank, you know, uh, my co-chairs, uh, Chloe and, and, and Franz, and all our collaborators that have been working uh, here uh, in person with us throughout those three days. I think uh, I'm very satisfied about the, 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 how the conference went, you know. Also, we have to, maybe it's good to remember that this was a fusion of two conferences of uh, two communities, you know, the, the concrete community, that of course, by Professor Bajant had initiated uh, with the uh, concrete association, concrete co conferences uh, since the 1950s and, um, and the bio uh, conference community, so the more photo mechanics community. And I, I've seen that in many sessions, that actually to be a very beneficial uh, um, co collaboration and discussion. I've seen a session where concrete people talk to, you know, photo mechanics people, more geomechanics people. And there is a lot of uh, uh, things that we can learn from each other. So I, I do hope that uh, this type of joint conference, of course, concrete will go back to being a conference and bio conferences go back to be some conference but i think yeah, you know we will try to still meet and and exchange and uh, the way we have that we that we're done in, in this conference so um thank you everybody uh maybe maybe we might want to leave the last last word to professor bajan since he he stayed here with us throughout the entire conference and uh you know we are honoring you professor bajan so maybe Let's uh, give you the, the last last word, and then we close this uh, Zoom uh, Zoom meeting. The one thing I want to say is that we chose the best days to actually give this conference. These are the three best days in Amazon that we ever have we had so far this year. So the, the days were chosen uh, uh, perfectly, uh, but we had to do it remotely. So that's okay. So Professor Bajan, I think all the important things have been said, but uh, I think the conference was very successful. Actually, one of the best, uh, maybe the best uh, I have followed in, in, on Zoom uh, during this last year of pandemic. And I want to congratulate uh, you and Franz for putting it together. And also want to thank you for affixing my name to the name of Bio, the giant. That was enormous honor and sort of also awesome humbling, but uh, I didn't expect that. That was your idea. <laughs> and I was extremely pleased. Great conference. Thanks.
Okay, this I think really concludes. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you soon, soon very soon. Yeah.